Hello, and thank you for joining us for this virtual share featuring the Earth Science All Around resources. I'm Aida Awad. I'm an education consultant and an adjunct instructor at AIU. And I'll be joined on this share presentation by Ed Robeck, Director of Education and Outreach for the American Geosciences Institute, and Steve Semkin, Professor of Geology and Education at Arizona State University. The resources found on the Earth All Around using 360 imagery to support place-based instruction website were developed as part of a recent Nesta AGU gift workshop and have been popular with educators since. Grounded in the principles of place-based geoscience education, the resources are equally important in face-to-face -face and online instruction models. Our goals for this share are to give you an introduction to place-based education, specifically teaching geoscience in the context of location and culture, resources for using virtual field trips with students, and a tour of the Earth Science All Around website. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Semkin, who will introduce us to place-based geoscience education. Steve, take it away. Hi, this is Steve Semkin uh, from Arizona State University. And uh, for the last 30 years or so, I've been very interested in uh, place-based education, uh, both in terms of research and actually in teaching. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the idea of place-based geoscience education and how you can adapt it in your own teaching. Um, to understand place-based education, first we have to understand place. So the question is, what is place in place-based teaching? There are lots of different definitions for that term, but I like to use the term that geographers uh, often use, and that is uh, a place is a location that has been given meaning by people, whether we name it, explore it, inhabit it, study it, imagine it, or in any other way experience it, uh, that location, that physical location, or even an imaginary location becomes a place. Uh, Ifu Tuan, a geographer from the University of Minnesota, a great scholar of place, put it this way. He said, what begins as undifferentiated space becomes place as we get to know it better and endow it with value. Um, I like to think of places as components of a cultural landscape. And again, geographers, this is a concept that's known to geographers that, that we can talk about a physical or a natural landscape that consists of, of essentially geology, biology, hydrology. So landforms, uh, bodies of water, ecosystems. Uh, like in the illustration on the right there, that's a map of Rock Creek Park uh, in the Washington, D.C. area by the National Park Service. And if you look at that map, you can see the natural landscape. You can see the Potomac River. You can see the stream flowing into it. You can see the, uh, the the greenery. You can see all of these sort of natural features, but you can also see places. You can see names. You can see features that, that people have put on the landscape and have given names to. And, and that cultural landscape can be thought of as, as being over interwoven with the natural landscape. So we have these two landscapes that pretty much anywhere we go on Earth, uh, the natural landscape and the cultural landscape are interwoven with each other. Um, I'd like to pause for a moment and, and ask you to uh, pause just for a second and, and think of a place that's very important to you. And, and as you do that, think about why it is very important to you and think about how you feel when you think about that place. We'll take a few seconds to do that. So hopefully now you've got a, a place in your mind and, and it's very important to you for, for could be many different reasons. Um, why it's important and how you feel when you think about it. Um, what you've done essentially is if you made a personal connection to that place. And scholars of place uh, have said that we make both intellectual and emotional connections. Um, we understand these places, you know, it might be a place where you studied or it might be a place where you were uh, like to play when you were a child or it might be a place where your family comes from. And, and you have knowledge of that place, that's intellectual connections. But at the same time, we often have these very strong emotional connections. We feel attached to places. Uh, in some cases, we may not like places. We may be sort of, uh, we might have a negative attachment where we actually have an aversion to place. But typically, it's a positive emotional connection. Um, so people in, imbue places with diverse meanings. Again, this is the, the intellectual knowledge that you sort of form in place. And at the same time, we form attachments to meaningful places. And if we combine that set of meanings with that set of attachments, we have what's called sense of place. Geographers define sense of place as the set of all meanings and attachments that are held by an individual or a group for any given place. And what's special about place is that we can talk about what might seem to be an abstract concept 
you know, how do we connect to place? And sense of place is actually something that renders these connections quite tangible. We can characterize sense of place, we can describe sense of place, we can even measure sense of place through the use of surveys or interviews or just simply observing how people interact in a place, like the students that you see here in the illustration. These are geology students from Arizona State University that are interacting with the Grand Canyon, a very important place to them. Place matters to geoscience education quite simply because we can't avoid using places. We teach and learn about the earth by means of places, whether we do it in the field in situ, like you see here, or by proxy, by using uh, illustrations of places or descriptions of places, or increasingly virtual uh, recreations of places that are done digitally. Uh, Edward Casey, a professor of philosophy at Stony Brook University, a great scholar of place, put it this way. He said that our access to space and time is how they happen in a given place. So in the very, in the very act of studying the earth and learning about the earth, we are using places and we're actually adding to the knowledge and the attachments that those places hold. Uh, like here, my former PhD student, Dr. Angel Garcia, is interacting with students in the caves of Puerto Rico, and uh, he is helping them uh, interact with that place, building intellectual knowledge about the geology, but also building emotional connections about the beauty of, of the place. So place-based teaching. Place-based teaching is distinguished from other kinds of teaching is simply that it's situated in place for greater context and relevance. Uh, Greg Smith, a great educator from Lewis and Clark College, put it this way. Place-based education is what happened before schools were created, before we actually built sort of artificial structures to encase our education. Um, situated in place. This illustration here is a, a place-based course in geology held out in the field at uh, Monument Valley on the Navajo Nation and it incorporated both the geological knowledge of the region but also the cultural knowledge of the reason, region that was held by the uh, indigenous Navajo or Diné people. So if you're interested in doing place-based education, how would you go about it? I mean, you might have a place in mind, a place or places or a region made of different places that are important to you. Um, how do you get there? And uh, we've done some studies. So we've, we've looked at a lot of work on place-based education over the years, and we came up with sort of a summary of what we call five design elements for place-based teaching, which I show you here in this illustration. The five design elements are to focus content on the natural attributes of the place, meaningfully integrate cultural attributes of the place in order to add context for the natural attributes. So again, you're, you're invoking both of those landscapes. Teach with authentic experiences in that place or in an environment that evokes that place. And here's where digital environments can come in, uh, virtual environments. Promote environmentally and culturally sustainable practices and policies in that place. When you're teaching about that place, you want to do so in a way that, that sustains that place in the future. And quite simply, you want to encourage any way you can students to form their own intellectual and emotional connections to place, enrich their senses of place. So if you, if you do any one of these things, then you're, you're starting on the road to place-based teaching. But it's important to know that place-based teaching is a continuum. You start by simply recognizing that the examples that we use to teach geoscience are themselves places. So simply using textbook examples from instructed places and identifying them as places, giving the name and maybe even saying a little something about how important they are to the people who live there or to a particular uh, group or, or uh, you know, perhaps some kind of uh, institution. It starts you on that, on that uh, trajectory down the river, as it were, to the opposite end where uh, in the end, sort of, you can actually have a course that's completely about place or a lab or, or some kind of learning activity that's completely about place where place becomes the subject and knowledge and skills from many diverse disciplines emerge to know it better. And in a course like that, one of the learning objectives is quite simply sense of place. It becomes an authentic learning objective. You want your students to enhance their senses of that place. So now we have this interesting quandary about virtual field trips and other virtual field experiences. Um, they have value and they're here to stay. And boy, you know, with what's going on in the world right now and the, the, the abrupt transition to pretty much all online teaching in many parts of the world, I think it emphasizes how much these virtual environments can contribute to this. 
And uh, the question is, can we make them place-based? We know that virtual field trips allow students to get into places, pedagogically powerful places that may be remote or inaccessible for different reasons. Um, in that regard, they can increase learning opportunities for students with disabilities, underserved students who don't necessarily have ready access to the field. Um, we're not saying that, that virtual uh, experiences are a complete replacement for field-based learning, but we've been doing research. Uh, my graduate student, Tom Roberto, listed here, has found that virtual field trips can actually help prepare students who are novices for a better learning experience when they do eventually go into the field. And hopefully we'll have that opportunity again too in the future. So the question is, can a virtual field trip be made place-based? And the answer is we think it can if that virtual field trip draws on the five design elements of place-based learning. I'll conclude this presentation by uh, pointing out this website down here, vft.asu.edu, which leads you to a whole wealth of virtual field trips produced at Arizona State University. Uh, many of them are geological, some of them are also anthropological or ecological. They take you to all places around the world and they can all be uh, run right on any kind of a browser-based uh, device. Uh, I'll also again say that, that in the uh, Earth Science All Around website. We posted a number of resources on place-based education, papers, and a few illustrations that you're welcome to, uh, to look at at your leisure and to draw from. Thank you very much, and I'm now going to pass it on to Ed Robeck. Thanks, Steve, for your presentation. I'm now going to take you through some of the elements in the Earth, All Around, Earth Science All Around website that are there for you to use and we invite you and encourage you to use these but also to share these and encourage your colleagues to use them as well. The tabs on the Earth Science All Around website provide a range of resources that you can make use of in your, pre your teaching and in your presentations. The workshop materials come from the original Geoscience Information for Teachers or GIFT workshop that this was created for a couple of years ago. There's the full presentation of the workshop there. Uh, some of it's easier to hear than others uh, because of the acoustics in the room, but it can, can give you a context for the entire presentation. And then uh, looking down further, there are there's a guide that helps you link a created 360 imagery virtual field trip to the ideas of place-based education that Steve just shared with you. So you can work through that and make sure that your virtual field trip uh, touches on those elements that Steve just described. The other, another tab that is there is the virtual field trips tab. And that connects you to a set of resources, one of which Steve has mentioned, which is the website for the Center for Education Through Exploration at ASU. If you look at the Our Projects tab there, that's one way to navigate to the immersive virtual field trips that were created by the Center, also known as ETX. And these are the immersive virtual field trips that Steve mentioned that are really done all in locations all over the world. They're made for a fairly sophisticated audience, but they've also been uh, set up so they can be repurposed for a range of different skill levels and audiences. And I've used them with teachers who are teaching middle school and they find them very effective in that way too. Scrolling down this page, you can see that there's another way of getting at this through this page as well. These also share those uh, virtual field trips that are done by ETX. And then down below is a list that we put together of other field ex virtual field experiences that are provided by other providers. Uh, and one thing to know is that virtual field trips is a term that's used in different ways by different people. Some people use it to refer to what might otherwise be called virtual tours, where they're more structured, others are more open-ended, but all of these have some potential for you to use in your teaching. So those are some of the resources that are available on the website. And we invite you, and as I said, encourage you to use those and to share those with your colleagues. And then Aida uh, can share with us a few last thoughts. Thanks very much, Ed and Steve. 
I have a couple of additional pages that I'd like to take you on a tour through. First of all, the 360 imagery and Street View pages. On this page, you have a live view of the Street View website where you can search for great images, as well as a link to a really useful document with a collection of resources that you'll find uh, 360 images and downloads. So now let's turn to a couple of my favorite tools to use when creating virtual field trips or having my students create them. Um, on the Google Earth projects and the Google Tour Creator pages, you'll find slides that walk you step-by-step step through the creation of a virtual tour using these powerful and free tools from Google. Google Earth Projects is a relatively new offering that allows for the creation of a virtual field trip or tour within the web-based Google Earth platform. As with most Google tours, building a tour in web-based Google Earth is fully collaborative and shareable. And this tool includes the ability to embed text, images, flyovers, videos, and allows creators to customize and view the presentation. On the Google Tour Creator page, Google Tour Creator is really similar to Google Earth Projects. It's a similar platform. However, Tour Creator is based on using 360 imagery. Tour Creator tours are also viewable in the popular Google Expeditions. So you can see an example here of step-by-step -step how to create those tours, and then an example of a tour from the AGU meeting in Washington, DC, that's embedded in Expeditions as well. Finally, on the Model My Watersheds page, here you're introduced to the Stroud Water Research Center Model My Watershed tool. The tool is designed to enable users to analyze real land use and soil data in their local watersheds, to model stormwater runoff and water quality impacts, and to compare how different conservation or development scenarios could modify runoff and water quality in a watershed. So on this page, you'll find some slides that will also walk you through the use of the tool. Well, that's it. So I want to uh, thank you for joining us today. And I want to thank Ed and Steve also. And I hope that you've gotten a taste for the, research, the resources that are available on this website. There are, are quite a few of them, as you can see there. And um, please come back and join us and take a deeper dive. So I'll leave you with this. Where would you take your students next week? What features of the earth would you like them to explore and to investigate? And how will you engage them in developing a sense of place that promotes environmentally and culturally sustainable practices? Thanks for joining us. Please reach out and share the ways that you find this website useful. We'd love to hear from you.